folks. Welcome to Time to Talk with Jonathan Cook. So I've just spent a really enjoyable hour and a bit chatting to Jonathan Cook all about indigo collar tags, which are the little metal tags that I have on my dog's collars, and how they came about and what they're used for. And then we talked about Dora's dairy and raw milk, which is something that I'm really excited to try because uh, it's got massive um, health properties, good good health properties related to it. So we chatted about raw milk and then we went on to nutrition, talked about a few podcasts and uh, a few audiobooks as well. And it was really good. I thoroughly enjoyed chatting to him and I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed doing it. So take care, have fun and stay safe. Bye-bye. Hi folks, I'm here with Jonathan Cook from Indigo Collar Tags and also Dora's Dairy and I've been so looking forward to talking to you because I want to find out all about raw milk. It's just uh, really exciting. It's a really exciting thing to talk about. But first, I want to ask you about your involvement with dogs and how um, these amazing collar tags are meant. Have you got any with you? Um, I can certainly get one. Do you want me to get really one? I can grab one because I've got some in the in the cupboard behind me. Oh, no, I've got one, I've got one. Cool. That was well planned and well organised, wasn't it? I'm, I'm so well organised on these podcasts, honestly. Uh, so, um, I want you to tell us about these first, because this is how I first came about you, John. Although it feels really funny calling you John, because I've always called you Jonathan in my head. Jonathan's, Jonathan's fine. I answer to all sorts of so names. Tell me about Indigo collar tags and why Indigo? Okay, uh, Indigo's easy because that was the name of the dog we had at the time. Ah, uh, okay. We were looking to uh, start the company. Um, we went through all the safe tag, secure tag, trying to find websites that weren't taken. And in the end, it was a time when Goldfish um, credit cards were available. Oh, so yeah. I, <sighs> everyone, knows what, everyone knows Goldfish, so why not not go for the dog's name? And it was because of that dog that we actually started the company. Um, we uh she, she was a german shorthead pointer obviously they're all loopy um and somebody walked past the farm she just followed them they went to a pub didn't take her inside left her outside on the main road so nice. she got to my dog warden now we're very much in in, in the very uh, like almost like an enclave in, in north wiltshire so we're very close to swindon i mean literally a mile away from swindon but because we're in North Wiltshire, our dogs, when they get picked up by the dog warden, get taken elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So she got taken to the local vet in, in, our, in our village. Um, at the time, there, was, there were two types of scanner, I believe. One you held the button and scanned, and the other one you held and released. Unfortunately, the girl that did the scanner didn't know how to actually operate it. Easy mistake to make. So she actually got taken to Bath, which... Oh, yeah, wow. It's a fair hike. 30 odd miles away. Yeah. So it was, a it was a Friday night, um, it was actually my ex-wife's dog. I was actually in, in Gloucestershire bailing straw. So I had this panic phone call, we lost the dog. So Man. bizarrely enough, my sister used to play hockey with one of the dog wardens. So I managed a very long process, got her number, she spoke, to, spoke to her on her way out of Bath on a Friday night. I don't know if you've ever been out of Bath on a Friday night. I, you... I used to live in Marlborough. I know Bath and Bristol on a Friday is an absolute nightmare. The M4, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. So I spoke to her and she's on her way out and she said, there's no way I'm going. Yeah, yes, I've got your dog, but there's no way I'm going back. So that's Bath, cats and dogs home. Um, so we went down the following day, got a bollock in because she didn't have a tag on. Even though she had the, she had the, the uh, uh, microchip, okay. even, even they didn't pick the microchip up. And we did get it scanned afterwards and it was working fine. So it was, I think it's 80 pounds fine. And my, my ex-wife got a good bollocking and, and, <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, the dog was a complete mess. I mean, she was really, when they're, when they're that, that, um, is that almost like that nervous energy? We, we, we were, we reckon she lost about 20% of her body weight overnight. She must've been frantic. The, the, so, the, I mean, she didn't, and she didn't leave our side for two or three days. It was, she was just with us all the time. So I, started to, the search for power proper name tag because anything with a you know you can have the best dog tag in the world it's got it's got a really weak ring yeah. or attachment terrible 
Um, and she would lose a tag in a day. I mean, she did, we called a hedge blind. So she would run through a hedge yeah. as if the hedge wasn't there. And, you know, the tag's just dangling in the, in, in no the hedge. No sense, no feeling. So you buy two or three and then you get bored and you just say, oh, oh well, whatever. So well, and uh, at the time, you know, she's microchipped, so why, why worry about it? But obviously you should have worried about it. So then we, I started to search to find somebody and I found a guy in America that was making these, these tags. I bought seven. Uh -huh. for my dogs and a couple of my friends and within a week of having those I'd ordered another 10 for another 10 friends so they all said it's such a good idea so cut that long story short I ended up being the European distributor for them so I don't make them somebody else makes them for me okay I thought you made them it's yeah. funny isn't it because in my head I'd associated it with somehow to do with the cows because I first came across you in around about 2007 huh? um, when did you set up 2006. So I was, I thought I was really early on because I can remember talking to you and I thought they'd just come out and I can remember talking to you about cows because being a dairy farmer and in my head I put the tags with some sort of cow equipment. Do you know how you make these really wacky leaps, these blonde leaps, it was a blonde moment and it kind of stuck in my head the whole time and how many years, 13 years mm. and um so we, when we come back from New Zealand, we were renting a place uh, at Walwritten Bassa, just next to, I can't remember what the pub's called now. And I was looking for dog tags to go on the dogs when we found somewhere to live. And then I came across your website, which was very different to how it is now. And then moved to Marlborough, got my first dog tag, started teaching at Wooden Rivers. And you gave me, I've still got them actually, they're in the garage, I meant to bring them up. I've still got them. You gave me this... Um, they were on a ring, I can still remember, they were on a ring and it was webbing and there was like some webbing with, and a leather with just a couple of little dangly bits coming off with your different tags on. And I used to have them in my dog training kit and at the first, um, the first night of a training course, I would get my little octopus of dog tags out, hand out the forms and go, right, you've got to get these, these are amazing. Yeah, we have a lot of dog trainers do that. Yeah, no, it's, it, they're awesome. They're so cool. They're so cool. And because um, they come in different sizes and they go on different types of collars as well, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they are very, um, I mean, like this. I don't know if you see that very well on my camera. Um, so that's, that is designed for an inch wide collar. And it's very oh. important that it is, it is exactly the right size. Um, I mean, on, on, on my dogs, and I don't know quite whether everybody else's dogs are the same, obviously my dogs are farm dogs and they run around all day in lots of cow shit. And I've got to cut those tags off. They don't fall off. I mean, we, we, guarantee, oh. we guarantee, I mean, they're, they're, you can't, you can't even bend the collar. the collar. Yeah. So if they're fitted to the right type of collar, uh -huh. uh, they won't fall off. No chance, absolutely none. Um, so we are, that's why we offer the lifetime guarantee. Uh, and I think... I mean, in, in the 14 years we've been going, I've, I've, I've probably replaced I don't know, 30, 40 tags. Really? They don't, I mean, they don't, there's no way. Really and usually, usually if they have fallen off, uh -huh. um, it's usually because somebody's taken them off. Uh, I mean, I did have one, one lady phone me up and said, oh, your tags are rubbish. It was one of these actually, I don't, I don't know if you can see it. So it's, the, it's like- Oh, the they, they're the leather ones, aren't they, yeah, with the deep shoulders? They can't, they can't fall off. No. And um, it was at the vets. At least she, at least she phoned me up two days, uh, two weeks later, and said, "Oh, I'm really sorry. You've replaced Oops. the tag for no reason." But <laughs> you know, um, the thing is, we 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 replace so few that the odd one that does come up is that's no problem. You just we just replace it. Yeah. We, we we have a, our customer service is really easy. Um, there, there's no argument worth a twelve pound tag. No. So if the customer's not happy. Or, or for whatever reason, we just don't get into into any argument with them. It's just okay. We we will refund you or replace you. So, I mean, I, uh, and I, well, one of my boasts is you won't find a bad review about our product. No. Fourteen years. Try and try and find one. You know, it's we've had a few customers that I mean, I had one customer at one point. I was sending the tags before payment. Um, oh. Yeah, I know. Uh, and I had one guy said I was stupid. For, for doing that, what sort of business was I? And I said, well, I kind of trust people to actually do what they say they're going to do. I had made, I, yeah, know, yeah. made a contract and it's, and he said, well, I don't think it's worth that money. And I said, well, no, that's, that's fair enough, send it back. And he actually did. So, oh, okay. but that's one. 
one, it's, I think. Yeah, yeah. People are funny, aren't they, with money? They um, they don't they don't appreciate the fact that something that's really really good quality will cost you a little bit more. But then um, I'm going off track here. Have you have you ever read Terry Pratchett? No. Terry Pratchett books, there's a character in there and I keep referring to him as Sam Vimes as the copper and it's Sam Vimes philosophy on quality or something and he's a copper and he says you know you pay 40 quid for a pair, 40 dollars for a pair of boots rather than 10 dollars for a pair of boots and you'll get more than four times worth the wear out of them and that's kind of the philosophy that I've stuck with for years you know if you want something to last you have to pay a bit more for it. Well, there is that. And if they've got a lifetime guarantee I mean goodness me. Well, the, the most important thing for me was security. Yeah. So if they don't fall off, then you know your dog's got ID on. Because very early on when we started, we, we had, um, I had a long conversation. I've forgotten her second name. She's, I think she started Dog Lost. Jane, is it Jane? Um, and um, she was saying that most dogs, when they get lost, get lost really close to home. Yes. So they've effectively just wandered off. Uh -huh. um, they're usually not lost, but they get picked up by people and taken in. And then you start this chain of, of, of trying to find who, who the owner is. Mm. Whereas quite often they could just let them go and they probably go home if they want to go home, obviously. Um, so we, I, I have this argument quite often about the uh, what should go on the tag. What yeah. information should go on the tag? Yeah. So you've got your legal requirement, which is your name and your address. Uh -huh. um, and having spoken to Jane, she said, and I remember a conversation quite clear, it was late one night, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we both had a drink, and <laughs> it was quite a funny conversation. But she was saying that she rehomed disproportionately more dogs that had their name on the tag than that, than that, than that didn't. So they had the dog's name on the tag. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, why ever would that be? And she was saying that because if, if somebody's going to, well, she said quite a few things. Um, I try and say them in some kind of a, some kind of an order. Firstly, if somebody's going to steal a dog to sell it, uh -huh. doesn't matter what it's called, they're going to steal it. Yeah. If they're stealing it to sell it, what they will do is um, they will maybe hang around to find out whether you're out calling for your dog. Because that's the first thing we do when we lose our dogs. We go out and call to yeah, yeah. Game, don't we? Yeah. Unless you're training it to the whistle, of course. Um, but then. I mean, I, she told me a story of a, a actually of a farmer with black Labradors like I've got who um, they they lost one of their one of their dogs his bitch, and uh, so they were out calling for it. So this guy turned up and said, "Oh, what's the matter?" And they said, oh, "We lost our dog. If you see a black Labrador, it's called." Oh my goodness! Let's see. So then they just go off. So if you if you're trying to sell a dog and it responds to you, so you know. Indigo, for instance, you know, you say indigo and it pricks his ears up. Nobody's going to doubt that that's your dog. Yeah. So what they'll do, they will maybe change the name to something very close to it. So it still responds. Mm -hmm. So she was saying that when, because when like the, the, I think I'm sure it's dog lost. It was, I think sure it's dog lost. When the posters go up, you get the, the visual. Uh, yeah. Photos. Some people remember names. If you've got both, then you're going to have a better association. So if you're trying to sell it down a pub, and I've never known anybody buy or sell a dog down a pub, but apparently it happens. Um, so they, they, there's, there's two, two cues for them to remember. Oh, I'm sure I saw a dog, a collie with that name, or something yeah. like that. So, and, and that, I think, was why she was getting more, more of them come home. But, but also it gives the dog comfort. So if, if you know what the dog's called, and it is scared and lost, and it's, I don't know, fireworks or something that's run off, if you can afford that dog's a little bit of comfort before you find its owners, then actually there, there is no harm in having that, that name on the, on the tag. So I think it's almost like a false security with the whole, the whole naming. The whole, so I, I mean, I had this conversation with people who said, I, don't want, I want as little information on the tag as possible. And I said, well, you want the dog to come home, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, of course the answer is always yes. And I said, well, you want to get it back. If it's the next street over, you want something to walk it home, don't you? Why have they, why they haven't got a mobile phone on them? You know, mm -hmm. and but also, I mean, there is there's the police aspect as well. Because if your dog goes there and causes an accident, yeah, you've got to have if if I know they're all chipped now, but at the time they weren't. Um, so if you if you if you if they can't get hold of you, then you know, if you just have a mobile number on, you know, hello, this is the police. Your phone, your your dog's just caused an accident. Well, I haven't got a dog. 
<laughs> I don't even remember your course. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's there's so many like. So really, yeah. two two numbers. Well, I mean, I always put two. I put everything on my tags. Yeah. The dog's name, my name, the address, and two telephone numbers. Okay. So if they ever get caught, and and you know, it still happens now because you know, my dogs run, wander the farm, and we got quite a few footpaths. And, you know, I get people phone up. Do you know your dog's over here? Yeah, I do. Thanks very much. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got a tracker on one of them because they, they, like, they like to go up hunting. Um, so in, in my head, and like I said, I'm, I'm in a really low risk area for dog theft and all the rest of it. So yeah. I can't, I don't, I'm coming from a point of security. So I don't necessarily understand um, those fears that a lot of people are in, in a city may have. Um, but in my head, you want the dog to get back to you as quick as possible with the least amount of stress to, yeah. to everybody. Um, so the most of the information on that tag, more information on that tag is going to get it back in, in, in that way. I, I don't know. Like I said, I'm, 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 I'm coming from a point of security. So I'm lucky I've never had a dog actually stolen. Or, stolen, or, no. Or, you know, no so. touch wood, I haven't either. I mean, I don't normally put my dog's names on. And I don't, I've never in the past recommended dog's names go on. Um, you know your name address phone number always your mobile always your yes. mobile because you won't be at home if your dog's missing um yeah. but, actually, but, but also if you, if you have your landline number on you can leave, leave a message on the answer machine yeah this is, this is true. you can also put the mobile number on there so at least the, the landline but i mean listening to your argument for um putting your name the dog's name on is is a really good is a really good reason i haven't in the past because for me it's like the only person who needs to know your dog's name is you mm -hmm. you know so but then i can remember we lost angus he wondered out because i didn't used to put collars on my dogs in the house because you've got working dogs i've got working dogs so i never put the collar i took the collars off when we got home and um my front door didn't shut properly i went off down to waitrose in marlborough come yeah. back where's my dog and my son was like i thought oh i thought you're taking the waitrose with you uh, no <laughs> And like that, somebody had picked him up outside of the house, took him down to Riverside Vets. And uh, the vet nurses didn't know him. The vet, vet nurses who did know him were in theatre. And the scanner was out of battery. Just everything that one day, you know. So, oh, so I might, I might have to change what I recommend goes on them. Because that is a really good idea, actually. It's a really good idea. I think it, it, it can depend on what, what your dog's like. I mean, if you've got a, quite a... A strong dog then maybe it doesn't matter but if you've got a, a, a nervous dog and just affording it that bit of comfort by using his name yeah. may or may not just help the situation I mean I think if like, like if, if Indigo when she went to Bath cats and dogs home if she'd have had a little bit of name it may not have made any difference at all I'm sure she would have been absolutely distraught no matter mm -hmm. what but having the name may have just given some comfort and it doesn't matter as long as as long as, as long as there's enough information on there to get the dog back that's the that's yeah. the key that's the key element what we're trying to do and yeah. i think holding information for security as actually a, is a misnomer and, a, and, and it's a false security um so yeah if, I, if, if something gonna steal your dog for baiting or, or or breeding or or whatever it's not coming back anyway and if they're going to ransom you you might as well give them the number you know <laughs> so the, the the logic for me is is is, is if, it's, if the dog's gone is gone if it's going to come back to you it's going to come back to you whether you've got to pay for it or whether because I'm a great believer that most people are honest. 99.9% .9 of the time, if your dog is picked up by chance being somewhere, he's going to be by somebody that's going to say, let's get you home. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 mean, I, I, hope, I hope so. I hope I'm right. I may, I, may be, I may be wrong, but I wouldn't think, oh, it's a dog, I can go and sell it. <laughs> it just doesn't... I mean, I think um, people either steal dogs to order or they do it um, opportunists. You know, I mean, I, I know from seeing dogs tied up outside of Waitrose, the amount of times I've stood there, you, you know, in Marlborough, like black lab, black lab, black lab, black lab, all tied up outside of Waitrose in Marlborough. And I've, and I've stood there and said, when they've untied the dogs, how do I know that's your dog? Well, it is. How do I know? You haven't got a collar on it. You've got, you know, you've got an old slip lead on it. How do I know it's your dog? And I get really... Um, angry actually i get really knocky when i see the dogs tied up because they're the perfect opportunity for people to go hello pooch how are you doing right you're with me i've got you yeah. and um and, and no collars either because well it's marlborough so why put a collar on your dog <laughs> precisely 
<laughs> yeah, way, way, way too posh. <laughs> way too posh. Oh, you know, amazing, amazing colours. But yeah, I find, um, and you've got to stay on the right side of the law as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, well, but it's, it's, the, I, I came from a position where I needed to have something secure. Yeah. So I've never had a problem selling my dog tags. If I meet somebody, I can sell them because I've been there. I, I, I can, I empathize with anybody that's lost a dog. Yeah. But for a matter, for, for, for a period of time and the stress to go and try and get the bloody thing back. And, you know, I, so I, I do emphasize. So I know I can absolutely guarantee my dog will, my tags will stay on the, on the collar. And that's a real, that's a real, it's a nice boast to be able to say my, my tag, my information will make sure it stays on, on your, on your dog it will be as long as they don't lose the collar obviously you know well wow. that I was the thing is, do you do you keep a collar on your dog indoors yeah does it your, your collar never comes off because no. you've got working dogs as well haven't you chitin yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah to chitin, yeah. chitin off when they're picking up put them back on yeah. you leave no. them on when they're picking up yep yeah. okay interesting. never had a problem what uh, i've I'm got sorry. i've got to ask this question what kind of collar do you use um, I use an adjustable type. Um, there you go. So the type that snaps together. Okay. Okay, so your dog doesn't pull on the lead then? I don't use lead when I'm shooting, no. I no, I mean, generally. Generally, you don't want your dogs on leads. Yeah. Uh, no, no. But even even so, we the, the um, I'd never have a dog pull on the lead. That would just be... That would be daft, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would be a really daft thing to let your dog do. Well, yeah, and I see enough people. We, we're on a bridal way here, and I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm no dog trainer. Don't, don't get me wrong, but I mean, my dog doesn't need a lead when we're out shooting. It doesn't run off, um, and if it does go on a lead, it just walks by my side. Isn't that you know? Anyway, so I see people walk past being pulled to the field to be the last ones before we get to the countryside, uh -huh. and I, I, I. I had one one lady with a spaniel and this poor bloody spaniel was like that oh man yeah and uh, on two legs uh-huh on his back legs all the way all the way past and i said oh come on you can't keep doing that she, oh he just wants to get and be let off and I said what do you do when you get to the end of the lane so i let it off i said just trying to get there quicker stop doing that just what you're yeah. doing you're encouraging the behavior absolutely I said, and i i'm so i'm no dog trainer i told her to walk around the block a few times with it Put it in the car bring it down here open the boot and let it out as soon as it associates that lead with free running at the end it was always going to try and get there quicker absolutely because she, was, she wasn't a very big lady and she was being she was being pulled along would have been a great canny cross dog brilliant canny cross dog. <laughs> um and um uh, it it subsequently did get a lot better after she just did that a few times it was just association you know it's not the dog's fault the dog's not misbehaving it's just wanting to it, Especially a spaniel. I mean, all I want to do is run. Just I run know. and run and run. I know. Just to get there quicker. The quicker I get there, the quicker we're off. And, you know, as soon as it hit that spot, the lead came off and off off, off it ran. So, um, I'm, I, no, I don't have – my dogs don't pull on these. But we – and I don't know if you've seen the collars that we sell. We, we, we sell these Walter collars, the um, – uh, Oh, I like them. They're made in Germany, but they're, the, the, the hoop – isn't on the on the clasp i'm not sure if you can see that yeah i can see that so that's really good so when you pull uh-huh you're actually pulling just on fabric fantastic because some of the old ones you used to sell the 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 cod the those like the lugs would break off yes but because there's no pressure on that lug now uh -huh. you, you get a dog that pulls it's just pulling against material all the time yeah I and, like uh, them a lot, actually. Yeah, no, they're really good. They're really good. We, we're very pleased. With them. I mean, I have worked with people's dogs in the past, and just um, you, you know, you learn you learn by your mistakes, don't you? And so I would, when I first started doing behaviour work, I would use the equipment that the people gave me. And I can remember this. I was working with this really aggressive. Oh God, I was working with this really aggressive boxer, and they had one of those. That's why I said, you know, this this clippy ones. And um, next door's dog came out. <sighs> on collar i was left hanging with this collar um it was it could i mean it could be really bad this dog was really aggressive and gosh what a nightmare can you remember that one um and and then you learn you never use people's equipment you always use your own equipment but yeah and when you got that out i went oh, but that's an amazing piece of kit. yeah i recommend them they're good 
Yeah, when when we when we started when we started doing the tags, we just did very basic um, tags. That's all we did, um, uh -huh. and we tried to do a few other bits and pieces. Yeah, but I found it seemed that a lot of our customers are very practical people. They want to spend a bit extra on the quality. Yeah, and actually, bling wasn't their thing. They weren't interested. They just wanted good quality. When we sell leather collars from from an Italian company as well, Furplast, and they're bulls leather, so it doesn't stretch. Brilliant. You know, stretch is yeah. longer and longer and longer. This this you know the, the leather we sell, we don't. And I stuck with them right all the way through. We 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 don't sell anything else other than the, that 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 leather. And we we so we we tried a few other bits and add on upselling bits, but we've just come back to doing very basic collars. Um, I'm grayscale colorblind. I don't know what colors they are, but um, there's a, there is a range of colors, uh -huh. um, and they're they're just practical. They're strong, and that but they're not blingy. So, and we you know we we're selling quite a few of them just That's because awesome. people. I think people look at us. You know, we've got a quality tag and we've got a quality collar. So we're not trying to make them look pretty or anything. I mean, they are, they are quite pretty. I'm, just, I'm I'm told the colors are nice, but it's it's you know we're we very much stayed to our core, to the core of what we were about. So it's just dog security. And part of that is having a good, good collar on your, on your Absolutely. dog. Absolutely. Good, good common sense equipment. Yeah. But you've, I've seen on your website that you, um, you sell them for things like kit bags and yeah. luggage and um, anything, that has, equipment, anything, anything that you can put a tag on. Anything that has webbing or, or, or a leather strap, they can go on to. Yeah. So um, we don't sell many for horses. We sell quite a few for horses for their, their head collars um mm -hmm. but we sold quite a lot to the army so if you'd imagine you're jumping on a on a hercules and you've got um 100 other soldiers chucking their bergens in the corner uh-huh and let's face it they all look the bloody same they all come across <laughs> it's got big, <laughs> big um so i mean some tie tie stuff around them but they can just put these tags on the outside and then they can just be distributed because they're easy to read but also because they, you can remove them they can go on the inside of the bergen when they're in out in the field so they don't need, they're not shiny and, and but they're, you know, they're always on. Of course. And we sold quite a few to Navy divers. And I had a really interesting conversation with one. Um, he wanted four tags. And I said, why? Why do you want four tags? And he said, well, I want one for each of my shoes or, or the, the, some, however he is. I don't even know what they use. Not. It wasn't flippers. He wasn't talking about flippers. It was whatever's underneath the flippers, I suppose. Uh, and one for my webbing kit, and one for my wrist. You can, you can fit them onto those. Uh, I call them James Bond watches. You know, you can just get strapped. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, they yeah. fit on there quite well. Uh, I said, well, you're, so you want? Why, why, why do you need so many? He said, well, if I, if I hit a bomb when I'm when I'm mine searching. Oh well, my I'm, god, that's really awful. That's just. I do your discount. <laughs> so you had a, you had a good discount. <laughs> Um, so, but the thing is, see, because they're made from surgical grey stainless steel, they don't rust in seawater. Uh, mm -hmm. We had when we first started, we did um, quite a lot of agility shows, uh -huh. and we went to um, I don't even remember. I think it's Paddock Wood. I think it must have been um, what was the big dog show they had in Paddock Wood? I can't remember. I can't remember what it was. And we sold some to an agility. They had the agility events there, and we sold some to a club. It was either Christchurch or Bournemouth or, or somewhere on the very much on the west uh, on the south coast, and I started noticing we started having a lots of orders on the south coast, and where everybody's walking up and down the beach saying, "Gosh, you want to get some of these tags? They're brilliant. They don't rust in seawater. Oh, the okay. tags were just falling off and rusting. Uh -huh. It's just like a wave coming out. I can't remember. It right to like Brighton, like Bodmin Regis. Oh, it was just like wow. going because we're tracking it like. And it's where people were crossing over and walking on, on the beaches and talking about their dogs and they'd see the dog tag and uh, incredible. I've done so little advertising. I think I spend something like a hundred pounds a year on advertising. Really? Word of mouth and repeat customers. So when we started the guarantee, we sort of said, oh, is this really a good thing to be doing, guaranteeing for life? Um, of course people move. How many times have you moved? You move. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know, I'm always, can I have some more tags? <laughs> <laughs> you know you change telephone numbers you get another dog you don't want to put the old tag on the new dog you want to bury it with it and um i mean 70 percent of our customers are repeat repeat business or or, or recommendations brilliant
And that, is, that is awesome. You've also, had, you know, regularly um, after holiday, any kind of a holiday period, um, usually Christmas, but Easter especially as well, we'd notice we'd have a spike after those holiday periods. And there's where people would go and visit other people with their dogs over, the, over a period. And they just have their my dog tags on their on their collars. The owners that they went to or the, the other house that they went to visit would see them or other people would see them. And we just mm -hmm. we, we always ask where on the on the website, where have you where did you get where did you hear about us? Yeah. And it's nearly always an existing customer. And to say we get spikes in January and, and, and April, May time. You see, I think you should um, I think you know, if I was like a boarding kennel or anything, I would have loads of your tags in. And, and just attaching all the different dogs, you know, for different colours on them, and then and then yeah. dog, dog, dog walkers do that. So dog walkers when they pick up their, 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 okay. dog, their dogs, they'll just put on because the, the, the one thing you don't want when your dog is walking somebody's dog if it does run off is for the owner to be called at work. <laughs> I've got your dog here. What are you going to do? <laughs> so, <laughs> that would go down well, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do offer discounts for for for, for um, quantity. Then you know we can. If you are a dog walker and you've got six or eight dogs, similar size, Labradors, whatever, just get the collars, click on it over their heads. It's, it's, it's really quite an easy thing to do. And, and, and like with, certainly with our collars, you know, if they are clipped on, you, you're not going not gonna to break yeah. it. So yeah, no, when they turn up at the houses, they just swap the collars, leave the owner's collar there and to put theirs on and off it goes. And it's a routine for the dog. The dog knows then that it's going to go off for its walk. And yeah, just, absolutely. And, yeah. and then they can have really good boundaries that the um, dog walkers and go mad at home yeah yeah changing the color so yeah Absolutely. yeah awesome yeah. now i i want to talk to you about raw milk actually and that was a big jump but i want to make sure that i get to talk to you about raw milk um i i know that i do know very little about it right. i know that it's got some amazing health properties and we've spoken before about it being good for people who are lactose intolerant because i'm quite lactose intolerant are you and okay yeah, yeah, and I'm desperate to try it. Um, but you can't buy it in the shops in Scotland. No, you can't. I did try Kefir years ago, years and years ago, for health benefits, you know, and it was... <laughs> I couldn't stomach it. No, I, couldn't, I couldn't even get it to my mouth, you know. <laughs> just, everything hard. about it just turned me off. Um, but I'm very much in uh, uh, using, you, you know, food as a... It's a medicine. Yep. And so why, why did you go down the raw milk route? Because it, you, you know, it's, it's unconventional at the minute. I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of people say, oh no, you shouldn't have raw milk. And there's a lot of people who are now coming around and saying, well, actually raw milk is the thing to do. And so it's quite kind of ahead of the curve really. Mm -hmm. And speaking, for, speaking as someone who's ahead of the curve a lot, it can be I really frustrating that to um break the barriers and be the leader and plow ahead and so why did you go down that route why not just stick to what's the pasteurized milk why why not why 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 roll i think um there's quite a few reasons firstly we've always we've always won awards for, for how clean our milk is uh -huh. yeah. um we would be uh, and I say we, he was my, my father was still alive, he was very much the same as me. Um, we very, very much believe that a, a, a cow has evolved to eat grass and it should eat grass. Uh -huh. So to go on the commercial scale, they're feeding lots of other things that maybe the cow hasn't evolved to eat. It makes them okay. produce a lot of milk. It's not very good quality milk. Um, Analyze as well. But you can't actually. It's like dog food, you know. Put cereals and stuff in dog food, and you know, or you've got this slimy shit, haven't you? Let's face it. It's just this is <laughs> this is true. Crap in, crap out. So we're very much we've very much been a low stress system. So carrots, grass. Um, you know, we're, we're, we tend to be predominantly hay if we can, um, but silage too. Um, so it's grass based. We do have a small amount of cereal in, in, in the parlour, and I'm trying to get away from that. Um, it's quite a hard process because cereal is so much cheaper than the alternative. So the alternatives are grass nuts or lucerne nuts, and they're I don't know, nearly 500 pounds a ton, whereas the others are about 250 pounds a ton. Uh -huh. so, I mean, our cows would probably half to three quarters of a ton a year. 
each. So it's not, you know, it's it's, ne- it's basically to keep them quiet. It's it's a it's a it's a, it's a treat, dog treat. You know, when you when they do something yeah, well, yeah. you get a dog treat. So it's just when they come into the parlour for milking, you give them a few. You, few you get that with treat to keep them happy. Yeah. It's just it's just giving them a sweet for for doing for doing you know, for coming in and doing what they're supposed to be doing. So the nutritional increase uh, is is very very limited. There's the amount of fodder they're eating is is minuscule amount. Uh-huh. Um. So growing up. Uh, I've got two two older sisters, and as children we were never ill. I mean, one of my, my my middle sister, my next sister up, uh, she never had a day off school ever. She's very proud of it, uh-huh. um, and we didn't think about it at the time. And actually, my dad had a heart attack when I was about fourteen. We did go on to pasteurise milk for a small amount of time. We all, we all hated it, and it was vile and it was thin and just tasteless and couldn't quite work out what, what the hell why, why would you um, um and it wasn't until i can't actually remember what happened what my turning point was i i i, I researched something on the internet and i can't remember and so it just popped up raw milk is, is whatever it was and i went well oh, that's what we do raw milk and then the, 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 then the following was warning you know past you, know, you need to pasteurize because it'll kill you otherwise and i'm like Really, but we're producing really good milk, and I just got into this wormhole. We starting to find that information about actually it was liquid gold. And I was just, I kept saying to my dad, This stuff is just phenomenal. We can't. And what, what we were doing, we were producing this really clean product, putting it into a tanker with other farmers that weren't as clean as us, just going off to be pasteurized and cooked and destroyed. Um, and it actually felt almost disrespectful to the milk. Yeah. To the cows, you know, we were treating these cows the best we could, producing really good quality food, and then it was just going off and being destroyed. And uh-huh. It really started to great. It started to grow on me, so I started looking at actually selling it. Uh, and it took me about five years before I actually started. Um, numerous reasons. My my, my dad um, died, and uh, you know, it's one of those things that you need to have help doing. You can't. I couldn't do it on my own. No. I needed another a, another person, and Sarah uh, came into my life and helped ha- has helped me sort all that out. Um, when you start realizing, I say you get in this wormhole of, of looking at food and realizing that actually what majority of people call food actually is is so nutritionally void mm-hmm. um, that when you start realizing that. Uh, when I realized I was producing this superfood, I was like, oh, I need more people to know about this. This is you know, I was winning awards for, for high quality milk um, and, and we're, we're tested on two things. Firstly, the health of the cow, which is the somatic cell count. So it's somatic cells, somatic basically means of the body. So in the milk, milk's akin to blood, actually. It's very, very similar. Um, so uh, if there's white blood cells in there, that would be, um, that would indicate inflammation. Yeah. So if you cut yourself, white blood cells go there. Yeah. So if you've got a very low cell count, which we always have, it shows that the cows aren't stressed, that the other, the, the TNs aren't under challenge. So there's no infection, there's no inflammation. Good food. So mm-hmm. straight away, we, we knew that when we, we, you know, we, I think we did a test on some milk. Um, my mother had bought some milk from a big, I nearly said the supermarket and I won't. Um, and I got it tested with our other mix. We test our milk every, every single cow gets tested every single month when she's producing milk. And I sent it off. And so the national average somatic cell count is 221,000 cells. Or it was at this point, 221,000 cells per milliliter. Sounds a lot. It's, it's, it's not extreme. Um, we were producing it at 42,000. That was our average. That was our average. Wow. So this milk that you're buying from the supermarket had an average of 221, just this one bottle. That means there's a lot of cows going into that. that are yes. actually, they're chronically inflamed, mastitic, ill, stressed. You know, it's like us, when we're stressed, there's physical, you know, your liver emits enzymes, your hair falls out, you, you lose condition, you lose weight. My cows don't do that. Mm. My cows, they pretty much the same weight from calving right through to when they calve again, whereas the, the, the commercial herds, and you know, the commercial, don't get me wrong, the commercial herds are looked after very well, and they, they are, the welfare is, 
is exemplary in worldwide standards. Mm-hmm. But they're athletes. So mine, I've got, I've got plodding donkeys that go down you know, Western Beach and they're going up and down, you know, and they just cruise through their lactation. Whereas the big commercial boys producing 12,000 litres a year, I produce about three and a half, four thousand 4,000 litres a year in my cows. I produce, so they're, they're, their cows are producing four times as much. They last three, maybe four years. I've, I mean, I've got 15-year-old cows, you know. I, I've had one the other year, I was 20. Um, she was a bit of a... I was a bit softy with her, to be fair. But um, so, it, 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 f- for my thinking, I could never understand why you would push. It's like having a racing car that you race, 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 and then after three races, you've got to get rid of it. Yeah. I'd rather have my bloody old Land Rover and you know keep going like hundred years, hundred, hundred races later. You know, just keep going around and around and around. And it just doesn't seem fair on the animal. Mm-hmm. We've bred them to be super athletes. And the breed, I mean, these farmers are incredible. They're, the achievements they've, that they, they, what they achieve is incredible. I've got to say, mm-hmm. I'm always amazed with the breeding and the feeding and the, the nutritional, I mean, all these cows are athletes. They're nutritional. It's better than humans in many cases. Yeah. It, uh, and, uh, and that's one of the bizarre things that I, this whole kind of like the, the vegan aspect, if you like, um, that actually animals are far, looked after far better than humans look after themselves. It's, oh, a bizarre, yeah. it's a bizarre situation where I knew, I'm sure you get it with some of you like, going to dog shows. You know, I used to have people come up to me with, well, I used to call it DIY dentistry because they wouldn't look after the teeth and it was like homemade clothes and the dog was so immaculate. <laughs> <laughs> You're feeding, you, know, you see me eating, eating bloody, I don't know, donuts or something and then say, no, the dog's got to have raw because that's about the best. When, <laughs> that was a strange. I, I get it. I get it. Strange, strange um, thing. So I think I've always been very much on the side of uh, letting the animal be the animal. Uh-huh. Um, and if, if you, and my, my dad always used to say, if you look after the cows, they'll look after you. Mm-hmm. And it is, it's, it's true. Um, you know, uh, antibiotic use is a big thing at the moment, um, trying to cut down antibiotics because, you know, we, we get resistance in the, in the human population. So we come out of the eighties, um, pharmaceutical companies will push, push, push. Oh, and, this awesome. and, that. and you know, as farmers, we read the stuff, our vets are telling us to do this. And so you, you go down that path because you think it's the thing to do. Mm-hmm. And it's caused a lot of problems. And you know, we are, the agriculture industry is guilty of producing some resistance. And, and human doctors too, don't, I think they, they've over, over prescribed as well. Mm-hmm. So we've not really used antibiotics. Our antibiotics aren't, aren't, aren't really a thing we've ever, ever used because we don't need to, because cows aren't stressed. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yes, they get it if they're ill, if they're, if they're lame, or, you know, and we can't, if it's an infection, they get the antibiotics if they need it. Yeah. But not routinely. Uh, I mean, like last year, I, because we are, we are monitored on, how, our, on our antibiotic use, uh, mm-hmm. and if it's over a certain amount, we're going to get um, investigated. Mm-hmm. And quite rightly so. And you know, some people are using antibiotics and they, they, they actually really do need to. So you can't say just because somebody's using them, they're, they're using them inappropriately, right? Because they actually, there's, there's health reasons in the, in the herd that are causing problems. But last year, I, I, I treated one adult cow with one intermammary tube for, uh, when, when she went on her maternity leave. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's just unheard of. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, we would spend. I don't know, a good few thousand pounds on antibiotics a year. And every cow would have had antibiotics at some point in that year. Good grief. Well, I hate antibiotics in regard yeah. to it personally. If I, I, I guess my, it upsets my system so much. Um, and so like going on from that, a lot of our customers have real serious digestive problems. Uh-huh. And they'll, they'll search us out because raw milk actually repopulates the stomach. Okay. If you have antibiotics, then you completely destroy all the good bacteria that's, that's obviously um, susceptible to the antibiotics. But you're, you, so you affect your microbiome, your stomach. Your stomach yeah. is, is actually, it's a, fa- I mean, it's, it's second brain. It's, if, you, if your it, stomach's it, wrong, it, it, everything it, else is wrong. Yep. Your skin, your digestion, your brain, everything. You, you know, de- depression is, is actually, they reckon, is, is a big problem because of your, what's in, in your stomach. I've got people traveling from Western Supermare, Ross-on-Wye, Bristol, Cheltenham, um, 
Chippenham. Did I say Reading? I mean, they're, they're, they're Abingdon. I mean, they're, they're coming miles, miles and miles, miles to try to get our milk. And when you ask them, why are you coming? Because it makes me better. Yeah. So That's, what what does it do? Because I don't know if you know, but I used to be. Well, I am a kinesiologist as well as a dog trainer, and so we um, we put a lot of store in the gut, being and and they found. Um, uh, brain cells in the gut you know there's a lot of information on the brain cells being in the gut and all of the things you know um your gut instinct and all of that lot it comes we're now proven that actually the gut is is absolutely right and i mean we've always recommended that you take um acidophilus you know if you're on antibiotics that you you balance the gut flora with uh you know lactobacillus and so on i can never pronounce it but acidophilus that's and you get milk. that so sorry it comes in my milk. it comes in my milk for free okay so that's what i was going to say so is it the whole um that balancing of the the flora in your gut you know the lactobacillus is, there's about five in acidophilus that we recommend and i can't remember them all off the top of my head can't pronounce half of them that's why but um <laughs> Whenever anybody takes antibiotics, the first thing I say to them is make sure you're taking the acidophilus because otherwise you'll end up with thrush or you'll yeah. end up with a dicky tummy or you'll end up with the runs. Um, yeah, candida, yeah. It's, there's, can, there's, yeah, candida, yeah. the whole lot, you know. Quite often when I, when I speak to my, my customers, there is usually a stress period or, or, or mm. some insult to their stomach, whether it be antibiotics or... or, or, or some illness somewhere along the line, which has completely put them out of balance and they just can't get right from it. Yeah. Uh, so the thing is that the, the like candida there out, out competes everything. It's just, that's such, such a strong ass bacteria, isn't it? Can, can bacteria candida? Candida albicans. It's a yeast infection. It starts off yeast, a yeast infection. Sorry, yeah, yeast. Mm. And um, so uh, if, if you think what, what raw milk is designed to do, it's designed to feed a, a mammal, uh -huh. a baby mammal. Everything is in exactly the right proportion. Mm -hmm. Proteins, the carbohydrates, the minerals, they're all, they're, there's, there's, there's enzymes to break it down. It's all, it's all bioavailable. Um, you can live on raw milk. And I've actually, one of, my, one of my customers is just on the end of a two week period of having nothing but my milk. Wow. And he said he's never felt better. He would say that because he's the mental person doing it. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, in America, there's a, a clinic called the Mayo Clinic. I'm not sure if you've ever Yeah, I know, I know about the Mayo Clinic a lot, yeah. Turn of the century, their major, their, the way they treated people was just with raw milk. With raw milk. Just raw milk. When people started going into towns, um, and this is why they started pasteurizing milk. When people started going into towns, um, getting food to them was an issue. It's not yeah. right now. You know, it's slow transport links so they thought well we can't get milk from the country into the town and for it to stay where it's right. sour mm -hmm. let's take the cows into the town so they took the cows into the town because there's no grass in the town so instead of feeding them grass they would feed them brewery waste or ba bakery waste just waste food oh the the take, are, they take it from the um i can remember doing a, a brewery tour and yeah yeah used brewers to, brains Distillery grains, yeah. The distillery yeah. grains, they take, that's what they take, isn't it? Because I can remember doing the tour. It's just yeah, yeah. to me. I, you know, you can still, you know, farmers still feed them now, but it's, it's, a, it's a, different, a different story now. So, um, so at the turn, turn of last century, um, these cows were stuck in these effectively concrete, concrete prisons being fed stuff that they, weren't, they haven't evolved to eat. The cows were sick. I mean, all of the cows were sick. So they were still milking them. So the milk they were producing was, well, rubbish. It's, with, with raw milk, it's got its own pathogen inhibitors. So um, like stuff like um, E. coli, for instance, you know, oh, E. coli is really, really bad. But it's really bad competitor, so it won't compete against other bacteria and it, it dies off. Mm -hmm. In pasteurized milk, it's got free reign, absolute free reign. Okay. But also, if the cow is ill, the cow's milk doesn't then contain those pathogen inhibitors. Uh -huh. So, you know, in the 1920s, the, it, it, we didn't know much about pathogens in the same way we do now and how to control them, temperature, chemicals and such like. 
So they were producing this awful milk, putting it into dirty containers, feeding it to kids, and they're getting ill and they're dying. So they're blaming the milk, or actually it was the, the well, it's not the cow, it's the, it's, the, it's the how, isn't it? So, you know, if they'd have actually let the cow be the cow, they would never have had a problem. Yeah. So they passed, they started pasteurizing milk to save people's lives. So the science is based on a hundred, hundred year old science, basically. So when people were getting ill, yes, they needed to pasteurize it from these inner city cows. Mm -hmm. But cows like well, I've got that eat grass, the milk is, 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 is inherently safe. The whole point of it is, it's designed to feed a baby mammal. And if you see a calf that's, you know, mum's let down in some, a little bit of mud, it's still sucking off it. It's still taking in that mud as well. So there is a challenge there. They don't get ill. I don't, my calves don't get ill. Um, and I think, I think we've, we've become so, um, so reliant on government approved food that our, that our whole, um, our reality isn't reality anymore. I know. So when, when we were when we were kids, I mean, my grandfather grew everything. We, you know, we kill a cow a year. We, I, mean, I, I reintroduced pigs onto the farm, but you know, we would have had pigs. We had chickens. We just kill our own chickens. You know, we we had real food when I was growing up. We had real food, and it was a case of right. Somebody needs to go and pick some broccoli. Ah, oh, do we have to? You know. <laughs> How many kids get the chance of that? Or actually, you know, so I mean, you see this broccoli in the supermarkets, and I don't go to supermarkets, so I, I'm, I'm talking um, local shop maybe. Um, and you, you, you see it there, and you, you know that that's gone on a massive journey through numerous different processes to get on there. Um, it's, I mean, it's still nutritious, but it's not the same as taking it out of your garden. No, it's also, we, even the local farm shop, it's not the same. It's like a massive footprint. Absolutely. Together. So people's react people's take on reality so if, if you talk to your grandparents they would go you know well yeah of course that's that's fine to kill a pig in the garden and you know you smoke a bit and you cook a bit and do what else that that's that's fine you, a, a i'm not going to call them townies but you know a, a, a more urban person would go oh god no I couldn't possibly do that well, I, I home killed a pig a few weeks ago here um <laughs> i was sitting there going oh i couldn't do that <laughs> Oh, but, but I can dispatch a pheasant, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know, no, no better food than pheasant. Let's face it. Um, and I think it's uh, psychologically um, we we've, we've removed ourselves from the whole growing, um, harvesting, whether that be circle of life or, 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 or killing of products it's going to be on our plate. So we've just passed it on to somebody else to do. You go and do that. You can do that. Let it come in a packet and have a government stamp, and it's bound to be safe. Oh my God! Some of the some of the rubbish that people eat is just it makes scale. I know. I know. Um, they don't. Uh, there's a story from a guy in America called Joel Salatin who went into a supermarket and was just buying some bits and pieces. It wasn't him. It, he was talking about somebody that he was he was speaking to. So this guy went in there and bought ingredients to make meals, and this woman said to him. You got nothing to eat in your your trolley. And he said, "What do you mean?" She said, "You got no food in your trolley. What what, what are you going to do with all that?" And he looked in hers, and she had ready meals. Everything yeah. was ready made, his yeah. pies and whatever else. And he just said, "That is my food. That's I make meals out of that." And she couldn't comprehend the fact that you would actually assemble stuff. Well, that's 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 mental. So I think, and that's obviously the extreme of it. But we've 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 as, as a as a as a culture, we've completely lost in such a short amount of time mm -hmm. any kind of visceral link with where our food comes from it, and it's, that's, that's a little bit scary it's really scary isn't it because i when i was 13 i mean my mate my mate used to have a horse and she kept it on the allotment and in the allotment was goats and floppy eared goats and so we would go in on um on the wet days and we'd milk the goats straight into our coffee <laughs> Which is disgusting, and you'd have to like, you know, you'd literally go, right, fish the hairs out and drink it. And but it was like the original frothy coffee, you know, because it comes yeah. out really frothy in your coffee. And um, and I now can't eat like goat's cheese because all I can smell is wet goat, which you, you know what I mean, don't you know that smell like, when you walk into a stable full of wet goat. Uh -huh. Um, but yeah, people think it's really bizarre that I used to do that, but it was really nice. It was fresh, stripped yeah, yeah. out the goat. Yeah. But, I think a lot of um, stuff that's going on with the food industry is really shocking. I, I used to, 
I follow this a really good um, dietitian called Zoe Hawken. I know Zoe, yeah. Do you know Zoe? Mm -hmm. She's amazing, isn't she? Yeah. And so the stuff that you, you know, if it's if yeah. it's got, got a face, it's a fat, and you should be, you shouldn't, um, you, you know, you shouldn't really, if you can't pronounce it, you don't know what it is, you don't know where it comes from. Or you can't replicate it. Anything. You shouldn't really eat it. Yeah. And and so that's kind of the philosophy that I've followed for years. I don't keep everything separate the way that she does, but I'm very much into checking everything, you know, the whole Ansel Keys study and how the Eat Badly plate came about and, you know, the fact that it's got fizzy pop on there. And so I I know I, I'm really quite shocked at all of that. And it brings, it really does bring the kinesiologists out to the front and go, the fights we had with the pharmaceutical companies years ago, you know, 20 years ago, trying to, um, yeah, I mean, they were trying to ban St. John's Wort, for example, uh, from ha having it on sale, mm -hmm. you know, because it was having an impact with what they were putting out. Well, li likewise with raw milk. Uh, and and so I can it, imagine it being the same with raw milk, you're, you're in for a battle. Uh, we've... Uh, <clears throat> One of the one of the problems of raw milk producers is we were very tend to be very small um, and very remote from each other. So we've only just formed the Raw Milk Producers Association. Um, last, we just had our first birthday. Um, one of the directors, we we needed to get something because we were all in the dark with it all. You know, and the, the, the testing procedures and exactly what we needed to do to make sure it was safe and like the latest knowledge and. When, when Sarah and I started, it, it was a case of we were just feeling our way through the dark, you know. Yeah. We, we, were, we didn't want to make anybody ill. We knew what we did was, was, was safe, but we needed to actually confirm it was safe, to actually, actually let somebody, um, uh, you know, be able to prove it. Yeah. Um, so we started to, to um, sorry, the dogs wanted to come in. <laughs> um, so we, we and everybody was saying the same, same thing. You know, we, we, we know we're producing good food, but we couldn't actually um, get it out there. And 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 part of what we've been doing because we, we keep our calves with our cows as well. Uh -huh. So we're like the next level up um, uh, welfare, if you like. And it's commercially a suicide. It's really difficult to make any money out of what out of, out of actually keeping the cows with the calves because so if a cow's going to give you twenty liters, let's say. Uh -huh. or if a cow can give 20 litres the calf takes five you don't get 15 you get five as well okay she's going she's to hold on for the other 10 because the other 10 is for her calf for later right so, Got you. So i need to charge four times the amount that i'm getting commercially than i, than I am that, that for, my, for my actual raw product that we sell at the farm uh -huh. um which is which is really hard but that's leading on that is how i met uh well how I got introduced to Zoe Harkham because we went to the ethical dairy up, up near um, there in Scotland, just on the borders. Uh, I'm trying to think where they are now. If you look at ethical dairy, Galloway. whereabouts? Galloway. 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 They are. Okay. And um, so she there. She gave she gave us a, a, a talk on it. And this when you start getting into that 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 little um, there's there's. As there are producers throughout the country that are producing top quality food that none of us knew about each other. And we're just like, oh, right. now we're all starting to get together. And there's, that's a real big band of people doing the job really well. Yeah. You know, high welfare, looking after, so actually putting carbon back into the soil rather than releasing it. You know, we're, we're on our journey now to be no-till. So we're not going to plough any land up. It's all going to be, you know, keeping carbon in the soil rather than releasing oh, it. Oh, fantastic. Um, using herbal lays to, like, self-medicate the cows and keeping the hedges uh, cut in a way that they <clears throat> they can self-medicate. Um, cows are just like dogs. They, they know what they need. They've yeah. just got to have, have access to it. So um, I read a book by um, Rosamund Young called The Life of Cows. Uh-huh. And she was talking about they they pretty much let their cows free reign, um, and they're in, uh, um, where are they? Shropshire way, Warwickshire, Warwickshire, I think. Um, and she was talking about a cow that got ill, and that went. She would go off and find a willow tree because it's got mm -hmm. aspirin. Willow's got of course, they, aspirin. yeah. And so I, um, we had a cow with mastitis. Sarah found it, <coughs> found it really early on, an E. coli mastitis, so quite a serious one, really high temperature. Uh -huh. 
So I went and cut a tree, uh, a branch off our, one of our willow trees in one of our ponds and brought it up for her and she ate it. The rest of the time, they would have just ignored it. And it's, so it's, it, again, we've had we, all these little, all these little things get us onto the journey of realizing that the cow is an amazing creature that can actually self-medicate herbal lays, keep the hedges long. If they're allowed to do that, the quality of their food is just exemplary. I mean, they're so nutritious. Yeah. So why not let the cow do that? That's that for me. That's a really logical, logical thing to let the cow be the cow, keep a calf, share the milk with the calf. As long as I can get enough people that share my my passion for good good food and the fact that it costs so much more to produce. I mean, co commercial dairying is 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 profitable but you've got you've got to push the cows you've got to take the calves away yeah i mean you know <clears throat> taking the cows away i've got to say it's far less stressful for the cow the farmer and the calf at 12 hours if you take a calf away from a cow at 12 hours she doesn't some i mean the whole side don't call at all they're, they're mm. completely, there's no maternal instinct at all um the calf will bellow for maybe a little bit a couple of hours until it gets fed and then it realizes that that teat is its mother um and so the, and then the farmer doesn't have to go through any stress and then the cow instead of giving 20 liters will give 30 liters because she's just programmed to produce it at the milking time yeah so it's a completely different what we're doing from the, from the commercial is completely different and you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to put commercial farmers down because I was one, at, one for quite a long time, and we looked after our animals well, just like they are now. But the quality of the food has it is different because of the way it's, it's produced. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's fair to to put these cows into in effectively factories. I mean, some of these cows never go out and don't see it, never see grass. And, you know, I, I don't think I could. I don't think I could cope with that. That would be yeah. completely against all of my all of my ethics. Mm. Um. So I'm not quite sure where we were going because so I've just gone meandered. Right <laughs> That's um, okay. <laughs> we've, we've kind of went for a little journey, haven't we? Can I just ask, have you heard of a lady called Caroline Ingraham? Caroline no. Ingraham. No. She developed aromatherapy for animals. She was um, the first person. And she's very much into um, having animals self-medicate yep. and giving them a choice of um, substances to sniff to correct what they need uh, correcting in them she's done some really good books actually um aromatherapy for animals and okay. she she might be somebody that you want to have a look at she's amazing there is a, a course done at Tetbury actually not far from us called um, homeopathy at welly level and oh, i was really? that sounds before. good yes uh, it's probably based on a lot of stuff that um carol did you say carolyn ingram um has done and uh this so I was supposed to be on it last year. I, I will be on it hopefully this coming year. Um, they do only do courses a year down at Dutchie, um, Dutchie Farm. So, uh, but yeah, it's definitely something that we're, we're, we're going to be getting into. That's great. Where can I get some raw milk from? At the moment, only at the farm. But, as you all know, <laughs> we're going to start doing mail order. Fantastic. So it was so we're funny because we're in Scotland and I said to my husband, oh, I've just seen Jonathan and he's going to start exporting soon. And he went, yes, he said exporting <laughs> from England to Scotland. It, and it's it, like, it, well, it is kind of exporting really, isn't it? It is. No, it is. And it's, it's, it's sad that you know, the Scottish farmers aren't allowed, aren't allowed to, to sell it. It's, uh, it's a backwards, backwards oh, move. How up. soon for your mail order? How soon can I get some? Very soon. You should have had some already. Um, the, the couriers are being a little bit hard to get hold of and track down and because it's a new business there is a little bit slow getting going uh -huh. so but but very soon you will be the first uh, you're the first on the list fantastic my guinea pig i'm really excited actually i'll tell my kinesiology friends as well because um although i'm i do my dog behavior in the pet gun dog i'm still a registered kinesiologist excellent excellent so, yeah let let them know well, the, the other thing with raw milk is you, you can feed it to dogs they can cope with it and cats. Really? They, the don't, they don't have an issue with it. It's got the lactose in it. Uh, so you know, lactose intolerance is, is a, an ability to produce the lactase enzyme. We yeah. don't need it because it's already in the milk. It's all, it's all there. It's a complete package. You said that. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm really interested because I've got an autoimmune disease as well. So I'm really interested in... Um, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very interested in 
in seeing what the raw milk can do, you know, just really? to level level my energy out, you, you know, because I take I take acidophilus quite regularly just to try and get my gut flora good. Right. Well, what we recommend for all of our customers is just a glass in the morning and a glass at night. So you're setting, setting up both both ends of the day. Cold, not so it has to just be straight. Don't don't, don't, don't mess with it. Uh, you can put a um, milkshake with it if you like, but don't put it in a blender because that ruins it. Yeah. Um, so people have smoothies and we tell people you make the smoothie and then add the milk. Okay. Because it, it, it changes the fat molecule. The fact that the, the fat molecule has to be digested in the lower intestines rather than straight through the stomach. Uh-huh. So if you smash it up, uh, like the, the, the milk you buy in the shops. Like the bullet. Yeah. So, any, so anything that's been homogenized and pasteurized, well, homogenization will make the fat globule go straight through your stomach wall. So you'll get a glycemic high. So, um, for instance, if you've got a kid with ADHD, yeah. that can I... cope with it. So give them a glass of raw milk at night, they'll sleep. It's the way the sugars are delivered. Because they're delivered slowly in the place that they're supposed to be delivered, uh-huh. you don't get these highs. You don't get the highs. So you don't have to pick them off the, off, off the ceiling. You know, he's going to... Uh, we've had quite a few of them, even um, Sarah's our, our youngest, he's slightly ADHD, and he's an absolute arsehole if he's not on raw milk. If, he's, if he goes away and then comes back, and, you know, he's a completely different person. And that, I'm really, really looking forward to it, because I do get that rush off milk, so if I, if I have a frothy coffee, yeah. um, I will get that high, and then they come down, but also I get that, and I, I noticed a sign of being lactose intolerant as you get that. Um, sour metallic taste in your mouth after having milk and you shouldn't have that should you and I get that after milk and so I go oh, right okay I need to keep an eye on my gut flora because it's not good there's also different proteins as well which can can, can affect it. do you know about the A1A2 protein that cows produce no um, uh, so the, the older breeds the Jerseys, the Ayrshire's um, Guernsey's, Brown Swiss they tend to be uh, they tend to produce A2 casein um which everybody can digest. Uh-huh. Where we've bred selectively for these Holsteins um, and, and, and some of the other breeds as well, we've actually bred that gene out. So they're producing A1 pro, uh, casein. And it's similar symptoms to lactose intolerance. You get kind of a full stomach and a, a bit bilious, um, uncom- uncomfortable stomach. So we, if somebody tries our raw, raw milk and, then, and they still have the same symptoms, we took them up because we have A2 cows that so we've had to genetically test. Um, we put them onto that and, and they go, oh, it's just like, a, I, can, wow. I, can eat, I can have milk again. And it's, it's, it's incredible the difference it can make. Oh, but I'm when, so looking forward to it. I'm so looking forward to it. I will keep an eye out for it. And yeah. um, we're going to keep talking. We've been talking for just over an hour. Um, That's amazing. Oh. I, know, <laughs> I know it's just like gone. Everybody it's, else has gone home. <laughs> 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 I've got bored. <laughs> Oh, Jonathan, it's been amazing. And I'm so interested in raw milk and I'll be putting it all over Facebook when I get some because I just, I can't wait to try it. And as I say, you know, hopefully level my energy out because I think milk is really good for you. Um, mm. But because I do get this, this spike and I have to be really careful on levelling out everything. So I'm really looking forward to getting it. Also, the carbohydrates were, being, were, were a big issue for me. Um, say that again? A- the carbohydrates get, you know, we're, we're, we're now very careful on what carbohydrates we eat. Uh, mm-hmm. I pretty much cut, cut them out um, nearly completely. I, I, a complete carb addict, um, sugar in my tea, shortbread, flapjack, Scottish tablet. Uh, oh my God, Scottish tablet, <laughs> don't. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've got a Scottish lady who lives very close to us that makes it. Oh man, have that in your mouth when you're drinking tea. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, like when I was milking, I'd have maybe four cups of tea. Well, that's eight sh- spoons of sugar before yeah. I even started the, anything in my day. And I had a blood test. We had a private blood, blood test done, and I was I'm just over the diabetic threshold. Uh-huh. 49 was my AB1AC or whatever it is. And um, so one of, our, one, of our, one of our other customers um, who I did the blood test through um, said... You know, basically, John, if you carry on, you're going to start losing limbs when you're a bit older. So like, Why? Okay. So the next day I went cold turkey on, on refined sugar, carbohydrates, pretty much completely. So I'm not, I'm not carnivore. We'll have a little bit of sourdough. I'll have a uh, limited amount of vegetables. 
Um, and it's, that has made such a difference. I still drink the milk, obviously, so I haven't quite got a carbohydrates. But I can drink six pints a day of milk, no problem at all. Um, when, it's, when, it's, when it's hot, I would just down a pint, yeah, easily, no problem at all. Two, two with my dinner at, at, at night as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not a big, I'm not a big drinker, so milk is my, the milk. <laughs> milk is my thing. And um, one of the revelations of actually cutting the carbs out is my lack of hunger yeah I'm not hungry yeah. and you know it wasn't a few weeks ago i did a 24-hour fast not um by design just because my life was so busy and i just didn't get around to eating mm -hmm. 24 hours you know i, I just missed i missed you know well, i only eat twice a day anyway now but i missed my breakfast which i as i was just before I, I just had my breakfast before i was talking to you um so you know if i have my breakfast at like midday or something like that um, that would be well, midday onward. We won't eat normally have breakfast. We evening meal seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. Um, I can go to nine o'clock at night without having any problems at all. Without even thinking about it. Eight, nine months ago, I would rip your face off after three hours trying to get some food. Um, one of my customers said, "Hunger isn't a, hunger is not an emergency," and that really rings in my head because we think it is because our insulin levels are dropping so fast. Yeah, we spike we keep spiking them and i was i mean looking back my my insulin graph if you like would it look like a heartbeat monitor it's it's amazing isn't it that's where the damage is caused and yeah and that was laziness just it was just easy to eat biscuits well i wouldn't eat a biscuit i'd have a packet of biscuits because there's no off button with my carbohydrate intake as soon as i start on carbohydrates i just keep yeah. eating them um okay, so with nice. animal fats you don't you don't have that problem because your brain goes you're full stop so my breakfast might be six sausages and a couple of you know, four eggs something like that okay that sounds a lot but that's i'm not having maybe anything else with it that might be it and i can go 24 hours on that mm -hmm. and I've i lost, mean lost have it. you read zoe's diet have you read the hawking diet uh, no no i've listened to quite a lot of her stuff and listened to her talk yeah, I mean, that is it. You know, it's like as soon as you start introducing carbs, you shouldn't mix your fats and your carbs. Yeah. Because as soon as you mix your fats and your carbs, um, then the insulin's released and then you get the spikes. Whereas yeah. if you're just eating, you know, yeah. fats and proteins, you don't get that. That insulin I um, I, spike coming in. It's I really interesting. I'm mean, actually, I'm turned off by sugar stuff now. And my, my taste was have changed. I actually like cheese. I never used to like cheese. Oh, God, I love cheese. I never used to. I used to hate it. Because I like, I like the sweet. I like the, the... But I think not having the sugar on my tongue now has made my, the, the, the cheese taste so much better. Um, yeah. But now, no, Zoe would be exactly the sort that... And so we saw her talk... Um, that was May last year, I think, in, in Galloway. Um, uh -huh. And that was a little bit of a revelation. Like, oh, my God. Yes, absolutely. Of course, it all makes sense when you've yeah. had it explained. And actually, somebody explained. Uh, I heard somebody speak, and I think they were American, and they said, in boy terms, which really helped me. So they they described your body as being like a dual fuel car. So we've got the electric and, and and your petrol. So you plugged your battery in overnight. You make sure that you've got enough. So when you set off in the morning, so that's the same as having breakfast. So you have uh -huh. some cereals in the morning. Um, you might travel 60 miles, your battery's down to a, th a third, so you think, I'll plug it back in again. Well, that's your 11 o'clock snack, that's your, your, your sweet tea, your biscuit. So you plug your battery back in, you get on your journey, and then you, and then you, and then you might kind of have, uh, and then you have lunch. So you, uh -huh. you cock up a bit more, see so white bread and, and bloody crisps and whatever else, uh, the carbohydrate shit you have. And then, and then you get to your evening meal, then you go and have lots of sweet stuff with it as well. And, and you never turn the petrol engine on. Well, the petrol engine is what burns the fat. Yeah. So you're never going to lose weight if you're not turning the, the fat burner on. No. And I know it sounds, it makes me sound really thick, but I couldn't actually, that was, that was a really easy way for me to assimilate that information and go, oh, okay, that's how it works. And if you stay in ketosis, and I, I think I am fat adjusted, you know, fat adjusted now, I just, all of, all of, all of every, every bit of energy I get comes from fat. And but I, I only look for it when I am genuinely hungry, and it's very, very, it's very, very rare now. And I've probably still got a little bit of weight to lose. I lost well over two stone now, um, 
and I haven't weighed for ages, but it wasn't a, I, I wasn't looking to lose weight. I was looking to be undiabetic. Yeah. Pre -diabetic. And it, it is amazing. I have the last test I had, I was 44. So I went from 49 to 44 and I'd imagine now I'm probably 40 or sub 40. Um, so I should be pre, pre diabetic and hopefully coming down. That's amazing. Um, but I think if you'd have said to me eight months ago, you won't have any sugar. I would never have believed you. And it wasn't until somebody said, you might start losing your limbs. I went, this is serious. Okay, got to do this. And as soon as I did, it was like the next day was just like, well, I'm not hungry. Why am I not hungry? And so I, it, it was, it was, um, it's like somebody smacking me around the head with a, with a sledgehammer. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is why. Okay. Now, now you're, now you're awake. I'm woke as they say. <laughs> have, <laughs> have you, have you seen the film that sugar film? I seen the film. What's which called? That that sugar film. No, it's on YouTube. That, what's it called? That sugar film. That sugar film. It's an absolute eye opener. It's an hour. It's anybody who's considering um, how bad sugar is. Oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And how it's in everything. Yeah. Uh, that sugar film is. It, it came out about ten years ago. Now it's, it was a real hard hitting okay. film at the time. Um, made me come off sugar. I think you've got to be looking for it then. I think um, I, I, I speak to people because obviously I'm quite passionate about the fact that now I'm hopefully pre-diabetic and I'm not ever hungry and you know I don't know if I'm trying to save everybody or not but you can see people glaze over and that's exactly what I would have done two years ago mm. a year ago even I would have just gone doesn't apply to me that's be, you become really for. passionate about it you really, I mean, you, you actually make me think I need to go and have a look at the Zoe Hawkins books again because her books are fantastic. You know, um, oh, what was it? Why the, there's a book she brought out, which is something like, um, uh, The Obesity Epidemic mm. that is a really good book, and then there's another book on, uh, why. Why am I eating when I want to lose? I can't remember. There's some fantastic books out there, and she talks about you know, insulin. Yeah, uh, and candida, and just amazing, and how important well, it, it is. Insulin, I believe, is a defense mechanism, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Your body's saying we've got to get rid of this carbohydrates because it's like the toxic part. We just need to get back to the fats. Your yeah, body, your body, injecting something to get rid of the carbohydrates. That's why we get inflamed. That's why our, our, our bodies are going. Oh Christ, we need to get rid of this this foreign stuff we put in our body, so we can get back to our, digesting the fats. I'm not sure who said that. I need to. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know that one, but I know things like, um, if you have orange juice, for example, your body will release enough insulin to, rather than get rid of an orange, to get rid of like an orange tree. And yeah. so your body, because of all the processed food we're having and the re everything's really concentrated, then your body will produce the level of insulin required to get rid of all of the oranges within a glass of orange, rather than like eating an orange. And that's where all the problems come from because they've put there's sugar hidden in everything and every time you take something your body's just constantly releasing insulin to get it out of your system as you say get yeah. the sugar out of your system yeah i mean like with, with orange juice that's not a natural product orange juice yeah. is not uh, oranges and orange oranges. is fresh is, is natural um sarah and i did our, our dna test we did a dna test to find out where our um, heritage is so i'm i'm very much north european very actually very English, maybe a little bit about um, um, Alberia, I think it was. So very much Northern European. We shouldn't eat kiwi fruit. We shouldn't have oranges. We can't process the stuff. We, it's just we're, our, our genetics don't allow us to actually process it properly. So, oh, I might do that. Um, um, it's, it's easy. Just do a mouth swab and, and, and send off. I mean, Sarah's very Scandinavian, so even more so, she she shouldn't have. So fr I mean, fructose, the 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 sugar in in fruit. Um, if you, if you, if you, if you, again, I think one of the other problems that humans do is we don't realize we're actually part, part of nature. We've removed ourselves. We don't believe that we're animals. We, we're so clever. Oh, well, that's one of the things Zoe says, isn't it? Um, humans are the only animals um, intelligent enough to make food and stupid enough to eat it. Yeah. So with, with, with fruit, I'm pointing at my apple trees now. <laughs> um, <laughs> with, with fruit, um, Fruit comes out in the summer, autumn. Oh, we, it, we put on we put on weight, ready for the winter, and that's how yeah. we're supposed to consume. Our food is, is seasonal for a reason. 
But because we're so bloody special and clever, we managed to then make fruit available all the way through the year. It's no wonder we're fat, obese, chronically ill, because we're eating but, stuff we shouldn't be eating at the wrong times of the year. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but you're probably roughly the same age as me. And like when you were young, the exotic fruit, I mean, is there such a thing as an exotic fruit now? No. You, you know, it's like, <laughs> if you were lucky, the bananas would be there and, and you know, it's like, oh my God, it's exotic. Look, it's, it's a, a pineapple and it's a mango and now they're just commonplace. Yeah. I don't think we can ignore the fact we've evolved over three and a half million years, pretty much prior to predominantly eating animal, animal fats and, and, and browsing for berries and such like. It's only been in the last 100 and, 100 and whatever years we started processing food, um, preserving food. Uh-huh. And, you know, well, even in the last 40 years, I mean, look, we had fat kids at school, but very, very few. You go to the school now, predominantly fat, skinny oh, yeah. people. They, 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 and who's, who's the scientist? Um, uh, Tim Noakes. Do you know Professor Tim Noakes? He was saying when he was at school, he's in his 70s, when he was at school, they had one fat kid. They thought he had cancer. Had one fat kid in his class, yeah. and they thought he had cancer. It's, it's amazing. Have you read Sapiens or have you come across the book Sapiens? I get very little chance to read. My, only, my, 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 my reading is in my tractor. I um, audio books. Audio books. Audio will save my life. <laughs> okay, so um, Sapiens on audio books. It's fantastic because he talks about wheat and how, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, wheat domesticated man. Man didn't domesticate wheat. And yes. so it's a really interesting because it goes right back to, um, I think there was eight different types of humanoid walked the planet at the same time. And right. Homo sapiens kind of, we killed them all off. Yeah. Um, but it, it talks about uh, like that, how we domesticated man. And then we, they ended up being all the different variations of wheat. And um, which is why, a lot of people are fine with the really ancient wheats, the spelts and stuff, but they're not so good with the modern wheats because they've all been mixed and processed by us rather than going back to the ancient grains. Yep. You, you, you know what I'm on about, don't you? It's, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is my background. I know you know me as like the pet gun dog. But uh -huh. My background is completely different. And it's why I talk about energy a lot in the book and talk about you know, using your energy and common denominator being an animal, um, because that's, you just tapped into my background now. So yeah, I would recommend Sapiens. It's got it's something like 18 hours worth of listening on audio, but it's fantastic. Excellent. But it brings you right the way through from, um, you, you know, it's like the evolution of man right the way through to modern times. And it's amazing. Yeah. Tells yeah, you it's good. I think we just, oh. we've, we've, we've ignored who we are because we're so clever and actually it makes us stupid. I think, yeah, I, I think um, corporations, big, big corporations have taken so much away from us and lack of accountability and yeah. <laughs> tribe. You've got to listen to tribe. Have you heard of tribe? That's, yeah. You would like tribe because that's all about accountability and um, tribes, you know, living as tribes again rather than uh just being on the on the the wheel yeah it's amazing oh it jonathan i can't believe it the time's just zipped by it's been so good to talk to you Likewise. and i'm gonna talk to you again once i stop recording but i'm gonna end the podcast for now and it's just been a pleasure i've learned so many different things it's we've just gone off on different tangents and it's been an absolute joy so thank you so much for joining me today Pleasure. it's been great thank you no problem bye bye see ya